How do you work across the aisle? So, I mean, in November 7, 2006, you become the nation's first Iraq war vet elected to Congress. And now you're there. And you talked about you know advancing the GI Bill, the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. You also worked on raising the federal minimum wage, Student Credit Card Transparency Act, and Improper Payments Elimination Recovery Act. And those are just a couple. But you also served on the House Armed Services Committee, the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, and on the Appropriations Committee. So... All of those require what we call on the podcast team ability, right? How are you actually going to work in and among a team and get everybody to, to coalesce? And you mentioned, you know, now, I mean, we could have an entire podcast on what's going on right now within politics and the divide that has occurred in America. And it's really funny, interesting here, and it's a little side note, but... We did it. Uh, our last episode was with a, a guy named Travis Holman. Um, he owns the, the Holman Company, world's largest uh, um, manufacturer of lockers. And we had an interesting conversation in that episode about this divide, that, that that the majority of people actually probably sit somewhere in the middle, yet we have really started to focus on these extremes where everybody lives at the edge and, and someone has to lose for someone else to win. But when we were kids, you kind of like came together and you fought it out and we didn't have social media and everything wasn't on an iPhone, you know, video, but you were able to solve problems sometimes when we were really young, less civilly, but at least they got solved. Then, but when you grow up, you know, you can actually sit down and start talking to people and it's not so public, but you get to find commonality. How do you bridge that? How do we bring people together? Not only how did you do it, but also how do we do it now? You know, I think I should speak louder words and, and you got to have empathy and you have to be cognizant of what the other side's saying you got to listen you know my my mom was republican my dad was a democrat growing up so for me i was independent my whole life so when i ran for congress i you know became a democrat but um to me every bill i introduced i always had a republican co-sponsor i i worked with republicans i lifted weights with them early in the morning i used to do p90x with like paul ryan who went on to become the speaker of the house like so for me that was important but I'd also say like it was always about putting the country first. It was always about where can we find common ground. So like even in a bill that was talked about for decades, like the repeal of Dennis Don't Tell, um, you know, I got a ton of Republicans who supported, but part of it is because I listened to what their concerns were. I listened, you know, when they say, Hey, we're wasting too much taxpayer dollars on this, this, and this, I'd be like, Hey, you realize that we just wasted one point two billion dollars because it cost on average sixty thousand dollars to recruit these young Americans that come into our force and, and train them up and we're throwing them out, not because of misconduct, but just because of who they love. Like not, and I, and I would say to them, Hey, if there's misconduct, whether you're gay or straight, you, you get thrown out. It's called the uniform code of military justice. But I would say we're wasting taxpayer dollars on this. Like, do you think that's right? And they'd be like, well, no. And I'm like, well, let's do something about it. Like let's repeal this thing. And, um, and we got there. And, and again, the majority of Republicans were for it, but you know, we could disagree on things, but you never, become disagreeable. And I think my most proud moment when we did pass that one bill that repealed the National Tell, a person who voted against it came to me prior, I won't say his name, but he said, Patrick, I will vote for this if you need my vote as a deciding vote. My constituents, I represent 700,000 folks, they're, they're not, they would not be happy with me if I voted for this. So I'm going to hold my powder. If you need me, I'm there for you. Um, but if not, I'm going to I'm going to vote against it. Um, and, and I was like, I, all right, I, if that's what you could do, I appreciate it. Right. Um, I didn't like it. I thought it was, you know, but it was like, okay, like, but he was the first person to shake my hand on the floor and say, Hey, Patrick, you made history today. This that great job. Like, and it, it was genuine. Um, I say that because too often, um, you know, they make it personal. And part of that was when you go in history, members of Congress that live there full time, I'm only two and a half hours away from Washington. I'm up in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. It's just north of Philadelphia. So I'll take the train, the Amtrak down. Take, again, it takes two and a half hours from my house. But the point is, it's like, I was home every weekend. I, I didn't spend any weekends down there. I was raising kids back home in Bucks County. I was, you know, in my community. I was doing events every weekend. Um, and I would say, I do think that we need more veterans in office because they they tend to work as teams, they tend to put the country first. They tend to tend to not answer this to political bosses or parties. They, they they try to genuinely find commonality and common ground. 